All right, so everybody, everybody, everybody ready? Everybody eating some breakfast? All right, okay. Let's go ahead and start. I know some, some people said traffic is bad, but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And, and, and so just, to, just to introduce myself, my name is Troy Patton. Uh, I'm with the Archer Funds. We manage uh, three NOAA mutual funds, and then we also manage uh, additional assets and different portfolios for uh, CPAs uh, across the country. So, um, and I thank, I'd like to thank Paul for having us today, uh, just to just, just to speak a little bit about what's going on in the markets, kind of where we where we anticipate the markets heading over the next year, year and a half. Um, obviously, you know, whenever you start uh, using a crystal ball, you end up chewing glass at some point in time. So, in fact, one of my slides uh, today, I really expected the Fed to taper, you know, yesterday, as most of you probably are aware, they, they announced they're not. Um, and so uh, I think that's kind, of, that, that's kind of interesting. That's why the markets really rallied yesterday, uh, gold as well, uh, which, again, I'm, I'm pretty surprised. So um, just, to, just to tell you, we manage a stock and a balance and income fund. Uh, this is really not a sales pitch, but just to kind of tell you a little bit about where we're at. So, so we manage money from the standpoint of long-term growth, income, bonds. I mean, we, you know, we have our we have a pretty good pulse on the municipal market. You know, what's going on in the in the federal and local governments in terms of their finances. Uh, as most of you know, it, uh, there's a lot of places that's not really that great. You know, so for instance, if you own Detroit bonds, you're kind of wondering what's going on, right? Because Detroit's bankrupt, as, as most of you probably know, okay? So just, to, just I just want to share with you kind of where we're at now. Um, it's really interesting. If, if, if some of you, if you read some of Paul's things or some of, the, some of the things that we put out, if you've ever seen some of that, um, you, know, I, you know, I hate to brag, but, you know, we've been pretty darn right for about the last four or five years. We've had it, we've had it right on where the markets are heading, where, they, where they're going, where they were going, et cetera. Um, in fact, this year, we, we anticipated the markets being somewhere around the 1700 level, um, and we thought euphoria could actually even take it higher this year. And people said, are you kidding me? That's a 20% return. Absolutely. And the reason is there's a lot of pinup demand. So really, for the last year, you know, we've seen the S&P 500, um, you know, I mean, as of yesterday, guess we're up another 1.2 some percent, so we're probably up, uh, getting close to 23 percent for the year. All right, that, that's that's better than a poke in the eye. All right. By the way, I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana. That's where we're located. So if I talk in like a hillbilly on occasion, it's okay. All right. I grew up on a farm. We raised hogs and chickens. So, all right, it's kind of how we talk. Okay, so. The S&P 500 has done, uh, has done really well. And, um, you know, so a lot of people think, well, gosh, you know, it, it, can't, it can't move much higher. But, but I'm going to show you a couple things that, and tell you that it absolutely can move a lot higher. And, in fact, I would not be surprised by the year 2017 to see the S&P 500 near 2,400, okay, uh, which is about a 10% increase per year, maybe even higher. And, and, I'll, and I'll kind of explain why. So in the past, if you, again, if you've seen some of our things in the past, we've always kind of given this baseline of where we think earnings are heading for the S&P 500. I will, I will admit in 2008 and 9, I thought the low was 815 on the S&P 500. We were wrong. It hit near 667. But from there, we also said for the next 10 years, we, we thought we'd see 13.6% increases or higher on average for, for a 10-year period of time. That's really that that that's fantastic. I hope that's the case. Because anybody that has a 401k or retirement plan and you're invested in stocks, you're going to do really well. So right now, I mean, and I know this is kind of hard to see. In fact, I, I got to change the colors on this. But the uh, but the baseline earnings for the companies that make up the S&P 500, which is basically your big companies, your Johnson Johnsons, your Microsofts, things like that, um, is $120. Okay. And a PE is a price to earnings ratio. And basically, so if I take, if I take a company, and I'm going to use Eli Lilly, if anybody knows who that is. Eli Lilly, if they earn a dollar a share and they trade at 15 times earnings, they trade at $15 per share. Simple as that, right? 
and, and most of you most of you understand that. Well, right now we're trading at 14.8 on a PE level, on a, on a going forward, a normalized going forward level. That insinuates the S&P 500 to be about 1775 by year end. Okay, 1775. That's another three to four percent increase from here, from where we are today. Okay. It doesn't seem like a lot, but frankly, we're in September. So if we had three months and earned three to four percent, that's not too bad. And conversely, on the bond side, we may not we may not see that. All right. Uh, although yesterday bonds did rally. Okay. But, but this is a real, we, we do a lot of charting in our office. By the way, uh, we have a, a guy on staff. Uh, he's a CFA. His name is John Rosebro, and and, and we, we create lots of charts. My dad was a history teacher. All right, um, I, I like history. You know, those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. Have you ever heard that saying? A couple times, right? Well, I love history, and I like to see kind of where we're at in terms of history, and 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 if it's and if we're going to repeat history over and over and over again. So we started looking at the different uh, PEs and and to, and to wonder if this bull market has run its course. Are we done? Are we done earning money in the stock market? And, and you know, and, you know, just a, a little caveat here. I understand a lot of people probably get up just like me, and they're always bullish, right? I'm not that guy. There are times when I think the market's going to correct, and actually, I, I I talk about it quite often. Correct, Paul? Correct. I mean, I I I will say, hey, I think the market's overvalued, or I think we're I think we're due for a pullback, and there's certain reasons why I think that. But I think long term. This is the 50s, okay, and this and this is the 90s. Basically, is what this mean is what these charts show in a in a matter of speaking, is whenever the federal government gets involved and starts printing money, okay, generally is what we see is we we often see higher interest rates, which we don't see today, all right, but we generally see an expansion of the PE multiple, and the reason is because money is very accommodative. The Fed is printing $85 billion every single month. You know, you, you, you almost, I don't, you'd have to put your head in the sand not to know that, right? I mean, the Fed is printing $85 billion per month, okay? So this is where we are today. Well, typically when the, when, when the government's printing a lot of money, we have PE expansion. Look at this, we haven't seen it. In fact, we've seen contraction. People have wanted to see what kind of earnings are going to come out of out of the different companies before they invest. So in fact, we, we've actually seen kind of a kind of a steady line here of the of the PE. We've seen a little bit of expansion lately, but it's all the the entire market has been driven higher by higher earnings. Simple as that. Companies are making more money. They're increasing their profit margins. Okay. But, but remember, the federal government keeps telling us there is no inflation, right? So for those of you in the room, as I always say, who, who don't eat or don't drive and don't use any heat or electric in your home, there is no inflation, right? Okay? Because the gas prices keep going down. Well, we're at like $1.20 a gallon oh, or three twenty, sorry, something like that, right? In fact, we just had 1,000 days over three, 3 bucks a gallon. Okay, but the fact is, people just like you in this room, our ownership of, of the stock market's low. It's at 52 percent. That's extremely low. Most people are afraid of the stock market because of what's happened in 2008 and 2009. I understand that. I mean, that, that was a tough. That was a tough time. It was actually a very quick time compared to the Great Depression. All right. If you study the Great Depression, obviously, you know that that happened over a significant period of time. But today, and because of our news and media outlets, I really think that we we took a Great Depression and we condensed it into about a 14-month period, and that was it. We had a housing bubble; it ripped apart the rest of the economy, and boom, that's where we're at. Okay, but now people are scared to get back in. So one thing that's going to drive the PE expansion is people getting back into the market. People feel like they've missed a 20% return in the market. If you didn't invest in 2008 and 2009, right, 
I mean, we're up we're up 100 percent or more. Okay, but but then you but then you may say, well, Troy, wait a second. I invested before when the when the S and P was 1500 and it dropped to 667, right? I lost a bunch of money, but now we're setting new highs again. We're back. The United States is undefeated in comebacks. We'd like to say the same thing about the Washington Nationals or the Baltimore Orioles, right? Okay. Are you either, I don't know if either of them are going to make the playoffs. Are, are they? Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Two thousand seven, sixty-five percent. Um, it, 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 it's that, um, actually I'm glad you pointed that out. Sixty-five percent ownership in two thousand seven, folks. This is what happens inevitably. We chase yesterday's market. If, when the Washington Nationals were doing awesome last year, right? Everybody's a Washington Nationals fan, or maybe not. Maybe you're a Baltimore Orioles fan, right? Okay, but either way, if they were if they were horrible. And they were 60 and 100 this year. You know, nobody'd even pay attention. Okay, but I tell you what, if they were the top contender, people'd start saying, "Hey, I gotta take my kids to the game. I, I should go catch a game." Right? It's no different. NBA sports, pro pro baseball, the NFL. I mean, look at the Washington Redskins. Right? Okay. Yeah, but but you know what? You guys have a good quarterback. I'm telling you, things will change, right? But 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 if if they were 14 and two, you'd all you'd all been like, yeah, let's talk about them, yeah. right? Okay. So it, this is no different. So we're at 52 percent now, but time and history tells us that we want to invest when other people don't want to invest, right? We want to scale back when we get to this point. You know, we want to reallocate. Here we want we want to invest, okay. And some of you have always, always seen this slide before. If you've ever heard me, I know some of you have heard me before. It's just like McDonald's, the Big Mac. I don't eat this anymore because of my heart, right? But but McDonald's from the period of 1972 to 1982 tripled their earnings. Tripled their earnings. It, I mean, McDonald's is a great franchise, whether whether you like them or not. They're a great franchise. Okay. If you were to if you were to invest in McDonald's stock in 1972 and sell it in '82, how many people think you'd make you'd have made money? They tripled their earnings. No, you'd have lost money from '72 to '82. And the reason is, it's not that McDonald's didn't fare well. It's that people didn't the, the PE expansion it shrunk. The, spring, the springs went like this, okay? Does that make sense? I mean, McDonald's recently, I mean, uh, back in, uh, two th just before uh, 2008, was trading at $16. I think they're near 90 now, okay? All right, so the question, you know, that people always ask, well, are we bullish? Well, obviously, you can hear it in my tone. We are. This is the slide I put up last time, uh, last time I, I was out here. I talked about, I, I put this exact same slide up, and I said 10 to 16 years of negative performance, which was the 2008-2009 period, all right, indicates a 20 to 25 year up cycle. I still believe that. Our economy is not growing in, in a real fast manner, but it is growing, okay? We are adding jobs, albeit way too slowly, but we are adding jobs. We, continue, we, we believe that this 20-year up cycle over the next 20 years is going to be very profitable for those people that are in the stock market. Excuse me. Okay? I, we, we still believe that to this day. All right? Earnings is an opinion. Cash is a fact. We want to focus on cash flow. The, the reality is this. Companies that are out there are, are earning so much money, okay, they're earning so much money that we now have record amounts of cash on their balance sheets, record amounts of cash. What, and, and you know why is that important? It's simply this: supply and demand. How, how many of you are business owners in here? Okay, if you were the only person in your business, right, and you had everybody to work with, business would be awesome, right? No competition. 
supply and demand. Pretty simple, right? In the stock market, we are actually seeing a de-equitization of stock going on right now. Companies are buying back their stock hand over fist, literally, hand over fist. Dollar Tree just announced another $1 billion buyback on top of the billion that they already had. There are less shares out there to buy now than there was back in 2004. There's less shares. There's, there's less public companies. There's, less, there's more money chasing less stock. Isn't that interesting? Supply and demand. That alone will push prices higher. Okay? If I'm McDonald's and I made a dollar per share, right, and there's 10,000 shares outstanding, and now this year there's 9,000 shares outstanding, I still, and, and obviously I'd make it a dollar ten. I don't know if my math is right, but a dollar ten per share, even if I didn't earn a, do, a dime more, if I earned the same amount, right? So it pushes the stock, it's going to push the stock prices higher. So over the, over the last several years, as all these companies, they're accumulating cash, they're not rehiring. We know that. If they're, if they're hiring, they're hiring very slowly. Unemployment, unemployment, I mean, you know, not to talk politics either way, but unemployment is not going to be coming roaring back. I mean, there's, there, there's health care, right? Companies want the cash on their balance sheets. They want to be able to do whatever they want to do. All right? They don't, they don't want to be told, you know, what to do. So, I mean, they're hoarding the cash and just buying back stock. Microsoft could go, could go private in seven years. Microsoft. They, they, make, they earn enough cash every year that they can buy themselves out of the market in seven years. Dell computers just went private. There, there was, if anybody's heard that, there was a big proxy fight. Dell's a public, or it's still a public company today, but it will not be here soon. Michael Dell is buying the company back. They have enough cash on hand, and they're generating more and more cash. Okay, this chart is hard to see, but one of the things um, that I do want to talk about from a political standpoint is how we, how we spend our money. Um, just to talk about the Fed and, and, and what's been going on a little bit, um, Obviously, they're buying back $85 billion of treasuries and mortgage-backed securities every month, $85 billion. They just announced they're not going to taper, and they're not going to slow that down, at least for, for the foreseeable future. But one thing the United States is horrible about, and one thing that our government has not done a very good job of, but I do think is going to change, is we're not spending a whole lot of money on construction. Okay? As I drove in here last night, um, I noticed that they're repaving the streets. Okay, um, and actually out on, I can't, I can't remember what highway it was, I mean, it looked like there was construction all over the place. Um, so, uh, huh? Every highway. Every highway, from BWI, or anyways, all the way here. It seemed like there, every road was being repaved or something was being done. So construction spending, this right here is the United States of America, right? We are 143 in construction spending. That's our ranking. You know who's number 144? Greece. That's pathetic, right? I mean, uh, I mean, Greece and uh, Greece and the United States. I mean, we're, you know, we're we're near equivalent in terms of per capita spending on construction. Is that government or private construction? I'm sorry. Is that public or private construction? It's both. It's both. But 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 here's what's happening, and 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 we. And is what we want to think is we want to say, well, the United States is printing $85 billion in new dollars every month. Where is it going? I'll tell you where it's going. It's actually going in onto the balance sheets of all the big banks across the United States of America. There's a thing called the multiplier effect, all right? And we, we've heard the term quantitative easing. Has anybody heard of that, right? QE1, QE2, and now we're in QE3. And where we're buying back $85 billion of, of, of debt, mortgage-backed securities, treasuries, et cetera. But here's what's happened to that money. That money has actually gone onto the bank's balance sheets, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and so on. And let, me, and, and let me explain why. There's a thing called the multiplier effect. Banks 
years ago, and, and one of the reasons that caused the bubble the last time, is banks had a multiplier effect of $6. So if you put a dollar into the bank, they could reloan that out, it would come back in, they'd leverage their balance sheets up to that $1 became worth $6. Okay? Right now it's at 2.3 because of the regulations from Washington, D.C. Okay? They, they, they basically, the Fed has come in and said, you know, hey, your balance sheets have to be a lot stronger. So, you know, everybody was complaining that the banks weren't lending. And it's really funny. They kept saying, and, and you know, I, Republicans, Democrats, take your pick. We're on TV. We've got to get these banks lending again. Hey, folks, wake up. You're the ones that told them not to lend. You're the ones that put the regulations in place that said don't lend the money. So all that quantitative easing, not all of it, but a lot of it, never found its way into the marketplace. It actually, all it did was increase the balance sheets of the banks. They couldn't lend. They had to, inc they had to, they had to put more cash on their balance sheets to true them up. Okay, I mean, J.P. Morgan was in a great position. They never, they never needed a federal bailout. They were made to take one. Everybody remember that? They were made to take a bailout. And then they had to pay the government back. And now they're still under the thumb of the, gov of the government. They're just settling for $600, $700 million on this whale, on this trading uh, thing that went bad over in the UK. I mean, well, OK, that, that's 600 to 700 million that's not going to get lent out, just so we know. OK, so nearly another billion dollars. And it seems like those guys pay a billion or two or three billion dollars in fines every other month. Okay, so our construction spending in Greece, we're all, we're all in the same boat here, but I'm hoping that our boats are a little bit stronger. So if we're not going to taper this $85 billion, hopefully the, the multiplier effect will stay at 2.3 and more of that money will find its way into construction. When construction starts ramping up, durable goods orders go up, autos, trucks, all, all, the, big, all the big ticket items. Okay. So what percent is uh, U.S. in terms of GDP construction spending? Well, um, uh, uh, Spain, Italy, France have higher levels of spending as does Japan. 21.2 percent of GDP. We're at 14. Okay. So, I mean, it's just not very. It's just not very good. Uh, in Indiana, they always tell us that bridges are are in bad shape. You know, and I, I wish they would mark them because. I drive over them all the time, so that way I know which ones not to drive over. But but it's not that simple, right? So, but, yeah. Wouldn't you think that you know when they stop uh, turning the money that the interest rates will up and that will tamp some of that growth? It, it, it will. Yeah, uh, uh, that's a good. Yeah, housing's already slowed way down, and I think that's one of the reasons why they didn't taper. The 10-year Treasury bond, uh, uh, Treasury note went from 1.7 to 2.9, almost 3 percent, in a matter of a few months. Housing, housing has dropped off the map. Okay, I mean right now. Okay, the the. Okay, nationally. Okay, so so the Fed yesterday uh, came out in their in their two o'clock speech and said that they want the Fed funds target rate by 2016 was going to be 4%. 4%. Well, basically we're at zero right now. Okay? If that were to happen, that that would throw us right into a recession. I'm 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 100% confident of that. Okay? So that's I don't think that's going to happen. The rate compared to what the interest rate is that we see on a daily basis. Well, the problem is the interest rates that we see on a daily basis is horrible. Uh, it, how, how much? How, what interest rate are you getting on your checking or savings? From the borrowing aspect, I'm sorry. Okay, from the borrowing aspect, so uh, a whole in relation to prime. So pr we're three and a quarter on prime right now. Yeah. So you talked about the ones at four, so that'd be like prime at seven. That's that's exactly right. It'd be close to seven percent. Yeah. Home mortgages. If the Fed fund Fed funds rate was at four, we'd probably see home mortgage rates close to seven percent. 30-year fixed on a 7% level. That's a big difference. Sure. You know, in the whole scheme of things, reversion to the mean, that's actually not that high. But it, it's, a, it's sticker shock. You can, you can afford less of a home, right, if you're borrowing. 
Okay. So, so, so to Paul's question, that if our Fed funds rate now that's predicated on uh, unemployment dropping, I think below six and a half percent, and some other things. But the ten-year Treasury, I mean, our cost of borrowing. See, it, for me, I don't think the go the government shutdown is the threat that we have to worry about. I think it's default on our debt. I mean, I mean, you know, the Republicans. Uh, again, I, I'm not. I don't want to talk politics. <laughs> okay, but okay, I'm pretty conservative, right? But th but there's a lot of moronic Republicans, just the same as there are Democrats in Washington D.C. If you haven't figured that out yet, okay, all right. Um, if if you know they want to defund Obamacare, they want to hold everything hostage to the point that you know. So they want to default on our debt potentially coming up here. That's a horrible move. You know what? If you don't like it, get your voters out and, and get elected to office and reverse things that way, right? If you don't win the majority, guess what? You don't get to make the decisions. That's just the way it is, all right? Whether I'm conservative or not, that's just the way it is. If you don't like it, you ought to vote, okay? Um, so anyways, I, I think a rise in interest rates is inevitable over the next 10 years, but I'm hoping that it's more slowly than going from a Fed funds rate in, from where we are today to 2016 to 4%. That's a big move, folks. That's a very big move, okay? So uh, kind of back to this durable goods spending. Right now, this is where we're at, okay? All right, so we're at 21% we're at on durable goods. And if we go to 26%, it's a $1 trillion swing in spending, $1 trillion. Okay, that, this is where we've been in the past. I, I, I totally believe in reversion to the mean. That means that, you know, water finds its equilibrium, right? So we will always find our way back to the middle of the road. This, this additional $1 trillion of spending between here and here will, will also pump up the stock markets, okay? That will increase profits in, in the current interest rate environment we're in, okay? All right. Well, let's make the other, let's, let's argue the other side here. Because because there are there are some serious um, serious reasons that we could have a have a bear market. All right, housing stalls on higher rates, just kind of what we were talking about. All right, I, um, in the Midwest, housing uh, you used to be able you could put your house on the market even just a month ago. Uh, no kidding, and and this is unusual for Indiana. And and people you'd have four bids, and they'd actually be higher than what you're asking. Okay, for Indiana, that doesn't happen normally. Okay, it may, it, I know it does. I was just in uh, San Francisco uh, last week, and I know it happens there. It probably happens here on the East Coast as well, right? I mean, because th there's, there's a lot of folks bidding on houses. But now in Indiana, it's completely stalled because the rates have moved up 1% on a 30-year fixed. And 1% is really, again, not a big move. But instead of four offers on a home, now they're getting one, you know? And it's and it's ten thousand below the asking price. Okay. Uh, the other thing is maybe everyone's all in. You know, we said there's only f people are uh, fifty-two percent invested in equities, right? Okay, or fifty-two percent of people are invested in equities. Maybe nobody else is coming to the table. Maybe we've made all this food and nobody else wants to eat, right? I doubt that's the case. Okay. Uh, we're chasing yesterday's glory. We're up twenty-three percent this year. Everybody thinks, you know, let's remember the dot-com bubble. Everybody starts thinking this is normal. Hey, we're going to get 20% returns. You know, it's not normal. We need to start thinking in terms of, you know, 7 to 11% returns. Okay? Uh, there's no earnings lift. A rise in interest rates, again, could stall corporate earnings. Corporations, anybody who's borrowed, though, is, has already borrowed. I mean, all the corporations, they've all refinanced their debt. You know, I mean, they're, they're paying hardly anything in interest. You know, they, they don't need to go out for additional debt. But should they have to go out for additional debt, that will cost more money. Europe does not exit res the, the recession that they're in. I don't think that's going to happen. They're, they've already started turning. All right? 
Last time Europe exited a recession, we saw 2004, 5, and 6 of 16% return on equities. 16%. I, I think that's no different. And then China weakens even further. The reality, have you guys seen, anybody watch 60 Minutes in here ever? You ever see the China thing? Where it's crazy, isn't it? Cities that are not, nobody even lives in them. They built whole cities. And malls. Stores. And malls. It's crazy. It's, it, it's amazing. You ought to go online and check it out. It, it's unbelievable. China has built literally cities that nobody lives in. I, I mean, as big as Baltimore. I mean, it's, it's unreal. I, I mean, and there's like 10 of them. Mm -hmm. I, I find that unbelievable. I don't know how that happens. But anyways, so China weakens a little bit. Well, I think they are going to weaken. They can't keep building cities. That, I mean, you know, they have a billion people, but they can't afford the homes or the apartments. Okay. Okay. Well, and then if you've ever seen my slide, I put it in again because I love this slide. And this is the Washington Hogs. It's a professional franchise, franchise who may start to play in Europe. This is the Republicans, and this is the Democrats, and this is everybody else in between. All right? These guys mess up everything. All right? Uh, you know, I, I want them to, I personally want them to stay out of it because the, the more they stay out of it, truthfully, the better the stock market does. And, and, and capitalism will take effect. Overregulation, just another slide that I've used in the past. We, we keep wanting to regulate everything. Everything needs to be regulated over and over and over and over again. These, these overregulations can cripple our stock markets, okay? All right, anyways, this was my slide that I was hoping that yesterday I was going to be able to use. It says the end of economic stimulus is near, right? But it didn't happen. They're not gonna taper the 85 billion they just announced yesterday, so this slide's no good, right? And then my next one's no good either because it was the Fed under Larry Summers. That's not going to happen. All right? So, okay. Well, anyways, so, you know, where, where do we go from here, though? I mean, I mean this, this is what we want to know, right? Where are we going to go from here? Currently, I, I always believe in a diversified portfolio. You should be balanced, stocks, bonds, et cetera, okay? But you need to make sure you're either in a bond fund or in individual bonds that can hold bonds to maturity, right? So, for instance, like in our, luckily, like in our income fund, we have not had any outflows. Uh, PIMCO had $9 billion in outflows. When you pull your money out of the bond market as interest rise, you will lose money. If you can hold it over the next four to five years, you will make your money because you'll get the coupon on the bonds. So you'll earn your 4 or 5% no matter whether we're up 3% or down 3% this year in the bond market, okay? It doesn't matter. You want to hold those bonds to maturity, okay? So you need to invest for more of a long-term uh, standpoint in the bond market. From, from the stocks, from the stock standpoint, this is where I said the mid-barrier was, 1765. I, this is actually the exact same slide I used in 2011. I have not even changed it. Does it look familiar, Paul? I haven't changed it. This is what I've been saying, and I've, I've just put it up here just to show you where, this is where I thought the markets would be, the low and mid barriers. So 1765 is, I think, a fair price for the stock market at the end of the year, okay? If I'm gonna go out next year, I, and, and soon I will, I'm gonna take this out to 2017, and I'm gonna have about 2500 on the stock market. Because I do believe that the government is not stupid enough and they all want to be reelected, that they're not going to raise rates that quickly. Because the bottom line is they just want reelected. And, and that's how, and, and, and they have to be accommodative. Otherwise, they won't be. You know, we'll put somebody else in there that's going to help to increase our, our net worths. Now, the sad thing is, this is how the middle class and rich get richer, and this is how the poor get poorer, quite frankly. It does create a disparity. Those who have money and that can invest in the market will gain wealth. If you do not invest in the market, you will not gain wealth. You will be losing wealth. And the, uh, the reason is simple, because oil prices will continue to rise. Your food prices, has anybody bought a gallon of milk lately, or milk? Has it gone up over the last year? 
two years, three years, it's gone up a lot. You know, again, if you don't eat, then you're in good shape. Okay. <laughs> All right. So basically, is what is what I want to tell you is you you should be in the stock market. You should stay invested. You should have a diversified portfolio, but you should not be in the stock market for a one-month period, a three-month period, or even one-year period. You need to start looking longer term. We need to look out to 2016, 2017. Where are we going to be in the stock market? Okay. Um, with that being said, you know, since 1924, there's been 114 10% declines in the market. We have more than one a year. The market will go up and the market will go down. But over time, correct me if I'm wrong, the market has moved higher. And it will continue to move higher. Consumer spending is doing OK. It's not great, but it's doing OK. We're going to muddle along probably for the next 10 years. You know, don't you like it when they set the Fed funds rate target at 4% in 2016? Let me think. Presidential election, they always do it like, you know, hey, I've set everything. I mean, Again, Republicans, Democrats, they all do the same thing. Oh, well, we set it up good for the next person so they can take care of it, and that person never does either. You know, so we just keep muddling along. All right. Again, it's not the government shutdown that's important right now. It's really the debt ceiling. You know, it's defaulting on U.S. debt or forcing a default on U.S. debt. You know, hopefully, the, hopefully the uh, politicians in Washington will get that get that one right. I suspect they will because. Even if we go through a government shutdown of a couple of weeks, we the people, I've heard that a time or two, we'll get, you know, we'll, we'll be up in arms about it, right? I mean, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go on forever, okay? Anyways, you know, it's fairly quick, a lot of information, right? Um, anybody have any questions? Paul? I mean, according to what you say, people would, depending on their age, they would be in the stock market. They would be in an aggressive portfolio if they were young. Yeah. And they might be in something less than that if they were old. Yeah. Um, just, yeah, just to, just to share with you, I put my money where my mouth is, by the way. All of my assets are invested in those three funds, the three funds that I manage. I've changed my allocation a little bit, being more heavily weighted towards stocks over this year than I have in the past. Because I do believe we are in for a long-term rise in interest rates. Okay? But, yeah, I agree. I think the stock market's a good place to be. But the that percentage you're talking about in stocks would be for you, how much? Uh, I, I'm actually about 85. Right, and what's your age? I'm 44. Okay, so that, that comes into play. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I mean, as you get older, I mean, I still believe in being more moderate, but you got you have to be able to hold the bonds. You know, you don't you don't want to you do not want to buy bonds at this point in time, with the idea that you're going to pull the money out in three to four years or two years. No way. Okay, that'd be a big mistake, because I, rates have to move higher. They're artificially low. Japan's tenure, by the way, Japan's tenure treasury is at like 0.86, by the way, or 0.68. It's one of those. That's the return, okay? They've been doing what we're doing now since the 80s, if you remember, recall the 80s in Japan. They've been doing that since the 80s, all right? But when you buy into a bond fund, how do you know whether they're, whether they're going to buy and keep them? Well, do you know that? Well, I do because we, we track the inflows and outflows of each fund. Um, that's why... Well, I see they need to sell them when people put redemption. Yeah. Yeah. Other than that, they don't sell. Right. Right. See, I mean, uh, sell when there's when redeemed. Right. Knock on wood, we've been fortunate. We haven't had redemptions in, at all. So in our bond fund, we've been able to hold our bonds, and I, I think our average uh, uh, weighted average is like 5.2 percent, and our and our timing is I think 5.7 years or something like that. You're saying basically the value might show as lower. Yeah. The return actually shows as lower, but because the coupon is 5.2, it is 5.2. Absolutely. That's what the value of the fund is. Yeah, the fund may go up and down. As long as you keep the bond. As long as you keep the bond, as long as you hold it, you're going to earn your 5% basically over five years, 5, 5, 5, 5, 5. So you'll get 25%. Yeah. So. Right. Like your 
the bond fund that you have is actually negative. We're negative three percent this year, I think. Yeah, Return. Year to date. Yeah. But actually, it's only because of the value fluctuation. Yeah, we're still getting our monthly coupons. Yeah, and, and if you like, if you're set up in like an art income fund and you're getting, uh, um, if you're getting monthly, we, we pay monthly interest or quarterly interest. I'm sorry. So if if you have a quarterly check coming, that's not going to change. You're still getting your coupon. That that amount won't change, even though the price goes up and down. That has nothing to do with it. It's just the interest that we receive. So, yeah. You managed three funds, one of them is bond fund, correct? Yeah. There's two stock funds. How many stocks do you look to put in each fund? Yeah, in the Archer Stock Fund, we have 50 stocks. Okay. And um, uh, and then in the Archer Balance Fund, it, it's about a 68 32 percent split uh, stocks to bonds, and we have about 32 stocks in that. And, and they're different. So, for instance, the stock fund is actually a more aggressive type, you know, more the S&P 500 or even a little more aggressive than that. The balance fund is, uh, you know, I mean, the largest holdings are like United Technologies, Johnson & Johnson, FedEx, Real McDonald's, Pepsi, Coke, Walt Disney, you know, all the names I'm sure you're fully aware of. The stock fund, you know, our largest stocks are BA Aerospace, New Skin. Um, New Skin's like a, you know, like the, uh, it's like a multi-level marketing type thing. Um, but we've made 100% on that stock this year. But, in, so it's going to be more volatile. Um, but the stock fund, I mean, you know, it owns things like Xerox, though, and Visa as well. But, okay. How does it work if you want to pull some money at some point? If you want to pull money out? Yeah. yeah so, like, if you, work, if you work through Paul's office, if you need money, uh, we don't have sales charges. <coughs> uh, the, the, way it, the way it works is there's no commissions. So if you want money out, you just call, you need money out, and it gets wired to you. Yeah. There's no sales charges in or out? In or out. There's no charges? Yeah. Oh. Certainly in the first year. Uh, no, only if you only if you hold it uh, for uh, three or four months maybe or something like that. If so you need if somebody puts in 10000 in short term later. <laughs> yeah, they may, I think they charge like a half percent. Mutual funds are not for trading. You shouldn't trade mutual funds. If you want to trade stocks, you do that on like E-Trade or you know something like that. But uh, but um, is what we advocate is long-term investing. And the way we do it is we use model portfolios. We not only use our funds, but we also use ETFs, exchange-traded funds, low cost. We try to stay at low cost for the clients. More than ETFs because I'm a little. Yeah. Yeah, ETFs are basically called exchange-traded funds, and basically what they are is they're a mutual fund that trades actively throughout the day, as where a mutual fund only changes prices once a day at the end of the day. There's really, other than that, there's no difference, you know, but you buy an exchange-traded fund like a stock. So, for instance, um, the S&P 500 index exchange-traded fund if you wanted to buy it at 1 o'clock today, you could buy it at 1 o'clock today. You could buy a mutual fund at 1 o'clock today, but you won't know the price until the market closes. So the price just changes faster? Yeah, the price changes faster. Yeah. So Will these sales um, that happen uh, during the day add up to capital gains or something to their portfolios, trades as, as sales? Well, yeah, if you trade in your portfolio and you make gains, yeah, that's... If it was an ETF, and the ETF is trading the stocks, would they result into it at the end of the year? Yeah, they could, yeah. Uh, but, but, see, it depends on what kind of ETF you're using. Most ETFs are more index-type ETFs, so they're, the capital gains is usually a little bit lower. I mean, so... Yeah, I mean, because we, we do, like, we focus on tax efficiency also. We try to make sure that we're, we're as tax efficient as possible. And we try not to we try not to trade, yeah, or or buy ETFs that trade. So, okay. What's what do you think is a good investment strategy? I, I've been thinking about drips. You know, where you put yeah. Yeah. Is that is that the way you? 
your funds are? Yeah, n no. My personal opinion on drips, I like them if, if that's the way you have to invest. If you have $100 or something like that and you need and you want to try to buy, you know, like you start with Procter & Gamble and, you, you know, that sort of thing. The, the, the bad thing about drips are um, you, when you send your money in, you don't, you don't know the price that you're going to get. You know, I mean, if you're doing it like on a set day every month, which is how drips work, dividend reinvestment plans, you, you don't you don't pick the price. Yeah, you know? so it's not always advantageous. Yeah, you know? in fact, drips. You know, there, there's books out that say, oh, it's the best way to invest. Drips is actually the uh, actually the the most costly way to invest. Yeah, you know? because just because of the sheer price, the way they do the pricing. For your funds, um, could you set it up so that every month you could invest five thousand dollars? Yeah. It's not drip, but it is. Yeah, yeah. Like like Paul and Kathy. Uh, it, yeah, I mean they they can set that up for you. Um, or frankly, uh, even a more diverse. I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not naive to think that I have the all the answers. I don't. You know, anybody that says they do, they're crazy. Okay. So that's why we diversify not only amongst our own things that we invest in, but we use we use other outside, you know, knowledgeable folks, you know, like Bill Gross, you know, um, in, in Harbor, and, and some of those. I mean, we use we use some of the other people that we respect in the industry that we think are going to do a good job. And so what we do is we create model portfolios. So our funds, as well as these ETFs and other no-load funds, well, again with no, you know, we we don't without the upfront commissions and all that kind of thing. And Paul and Kathy, I mean, they can, they can help figure out what your risk tolerance is and, and invest that way. So, Kathy? Um, I couldn't hear everything that the gentleman was talking about, but maybe some other people that don't know what the drip is. Drip? Uh, dividend reinvestment plan. It's where you send in money every month to one company. You know, you get on like a subscription type basis of buying stock. I mean, it's okay. I mean, there, there's nothing wrong with it. Frankly, you, you should all invest. What's the difference in that versus the, excuse me, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Dollar cost averaging. I mean, where you're just buying stocks throughout the whole year versus just dumping in 5,000 once a year. Yeah, dollar cost averaging is not bad because if you're buying a basket of stocks, right? As opposed to doing a drip with one stock mm -hmm. or three stocks. I see. Okay. See, I mean that. Uh, I mean the qu the question is, you know, what's the difference between dollar cost averaging, you know, between investing your money and and the drips? Well, dollar cost averaging, typically speaking, you're going to invest in a fund or some type of investment profile where you're buying a lot of different things. So it's a diversified investment, into, as opposed to buying Procter & Gamble, depending on where Procter & Gamble is that day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm surprised nobody's asked me about gold. Yeah. But Didn't we miss the boat on gold? That's what I keep saying. Yeah. I think gold's going to 900 to 1,000 an ounce. That's, that's, I, I, in fact, last year, I think when it was 1,800, I think I said I, I, I put a price target of 12 to 1,300 on it. I now think it's going to go 900 to 1,000, ultimately. Uh, because you can't eat gold. It doesn't pay a dividend. It doesn't pay interest. And if things get really bad, shotguns and ammunition are the way to go. That's yeah. But, but, but the, the, the truth is gold is not backed by any government that is stable. Not even the Swiss will back the price of gold. So the gold is just what people are willing to pay for it, right? Now, as we create more currency, potentially, you know, gold, gold moves higher. But, there, you know, I can't trade gold through my Visa card, you know, right? It doesn't, I mean. They do it in India, China, Indonesia. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that, that's, but I, I, I've actually been overseas a few times. And, and that's because you can't use a credit card everywhere, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, touch on the big run up that the price of gold we've seen over the past few years, and now it's coming back down. Yeah. What are the factors influencing the run up and the decline? Yeah. 
Well, for instance, uh, j just to this gentleman's point, uh, one, one more point on, on some of the Asian uh, or, 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 or the uh, emerging markets using gold, you can't, their currencies aren't trusted as, as well as, for instance, the, the, the yen, the dollar, the Australian dollar, the pound, even the Mexican peso, I mean, quite frankly. So, um, you know, from that standpoint, I think, you know, yeah, gold will continue to have a place over, especially India, Pakistan, places like that, uh, you know, gold is, gold is very prevalent. In fact, I know pe I, people trade in gold over there. Um, from the standpoint of gold going up to 18, 1900 and now back into the 1300s and the run up in gold, the, the run up in gold was based on the fact that 2008, 2009 and before happened when the, our United States government is printing currency, and we still are. We're still printing currency. But people, always, people kept saying the dollar is going to collapse, that, that, that uh, the United Nations, by the way, wants to come out with their own currency. It's been talked about for years. Well, I mean, no offense, I don't think anybody trusts the United Nations. You know, I mean, I'm just hopefully nobody works for them here in this room. But, but, but I don't think anybody trusts them. I mean, they trust them less than they trust the United States. So I don't think that's going to happen. And I think one of the things people thought of, well, gold was going to be the standard then on on a on a more of a global basket of currencies. And it hasn't come to any fruition, and I don't think it will. You know, uh, I think gold is is more the doomsday type scenario. Um, and uh, like I said previous, the United States is undefeated in comebacks. We are undefeated, and until somebody proves me different, you know, I'd say that that's probably going to continue. Because there's, there's two countries in this world that can print as much currency as they've ever wanted to. That's the United States and Japan. Both of those countries, they can print as much as they want. Japan's been doing it since the 80s. Hadn't caught up with them yet. I still think it's going to, but it hasn't yet. Yeah. Will it catch up with the United States at some point? Probably. And we, can't, we can't keep printing the, the currency. We can't keep going into debt at the rate we're going. So... Yeah. Are you investing in different countries? Stocks? Yeah, we do. Yeah, we yeah we, we invest uh, we invest in emerging markets. Uh, they haven't done as well, obviously, lately. Uh, we even invest in uh, uh, currencies. In in our income fund, for instance, we will buy like a General Electric bond that's denominated in Mexican peso, or um, like an Indonesian rupee, uh, or the Australian dollar. Uh, the Brazilian real; those are different countries that we've invested in. Their well. I'm sorry. It, it did not do as well. Um, in fact, their their currency to the U.S. dollar dropped quite significantly. Although yesterday everybody got a boost because the U.S. dollar dropped, and I think the U.S. dollar is down a little bit today. Um, but uh, one thing that has really surprised me is we are the best of the worst right now. And what I mean by that is. Although we haven't done that well, I mean, our, our government hasn't done that well. Um, you know what? I mean, everybody else has done worse than we have. So everybody's been clamoring to the U.S. dollar, which has made the dollar rise. But I ultimately think the U.S. dollar will depreciate by about 30 to 35 percent over the next 10 years. So, um, for instance, if you were to invest in the Australian dollar or a bond that yields 6 percent on an investment grade in the Australian dollar, if Australia's dollar does better, you'll not only get that currency appreciation, but you'll also get that coupon. And so, you know, we, we, we do that for actually about 15% of our portfolio. So are you calling this part with you investing in different countries? Do you, you call it an aggressive strategy? Um, well, it, it's not as aggressive. I mean, if we're still buying bonds, uh, is what we have. Our risk is currency risk as opposed to... Um, as opposed to, uh, um, you know, default risk, okay, where, you know, G General Electric goes out of business and they can't pay us back. I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, the currency risk, um, you know, th there are some risks there, but, you know, countries like Australia, uh, London, 
uh, I hate to say this, but Mexico, their balance sheet is getting better than ours. You know, I mean, the peso is actually doing fairly well. You know, Brazil is still the wild, wild west, but they're doing well. I mean, I mean that, that, that place has done phenomenal and probably will continue to do so. You know. So I wouldn't say it's aggressive. I'd say I'd say I'd say it's more moderate. You know, it's more aggressive than a pure United States bond, but you know, but not not a whole lot. Which stocks is more aggressive? Uh, which, which countries? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'd say like India. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, I, I like India now though because it's been it's been whacked. Um, in fact, one of the slides that I had up before. Um, th this right here, if this was if this was all a bunch of different countries, your emerging markets would be here. They'd have negative returns currently, and then your developed countries typically have had positive returns. Okay, there are times I do believe that you know we go heavier into emerging markets, but and right now we are. But I mean, you know, our emerging market exposure completely over all our portfolios is more in the way of three to four percent. Okay. Some, sometimes we will ramp that up to 7%, but that's about it. Because we still think the United States is the best place to invest. We still have the best accounting standards, you know, thanks to our, all our CPAs. I'm a CPA also, but mine stands for cut, paste, and assemble. So at this point in time, that's how I make charts. You know, you know. Paul's actually more knowledgeable. And Bill, yeah. When you say invest in India uh, equities, does it impact? Are these the ADRs of the Indian stocks? Or, or well, well, e in Indian well, even like the ETF, like uh, the symbols PIN, PIN, okay? It, it's uh, it, it's like the Indian stock market. Uh, you can you can invest in things like that, but um, uh, you just have to be very careful. You know, like South Korea. South Korea is a, a, a Good emerging market, you know that I like. I actually like India. I mean, it, it, obviously India has its own problems, just like we have ours. But you know, and the, and their currency is less stable. That's. So is there a uh, symbol for the Archer funds, or custom made? Well, we again, we well we custom customize the portfolios to the individual needs. So why you ask in the stocks? Yeah, yeah. And what is part of funds is in this talk name about of the company? Can we talk about the five funds, the five portfolios? Oh, okay. The three uh, funds that you just oh, mentioned. Oh, okay, okay. So, so, and this will, this will kind of go along with your question. So we, so we manage five different portfolios. Everything from aggressive down to conservative, okay? And, and, we, and, we, and in each of those portfolios, there's eight to ten different holdings of ETFs or no-load mutual funds. And from, that, and from that, we get our diversification, whether it be emerging markets, U.S. stock, gold, et cetera. Okay? Um, so at the, at the most conservative level, you know, you're looking at uh, you know, more bonds, income type producing assets. The most aggressive level, you're looking at pretty much all stocks. Okay, within those within those portfolios, we have three mutual funds. Okay, the three mutual funds are stock, balance, and income, and they have a place in the portfolios. Okay, so we manage those mutual funds, and then we also manage the portfolios that our mutual funds are within. That and other investments. And uh, three income. Uh, balances and uh, stock funds. Besides that, in the five portfolios, are pretty much any investments available. Oh yeah, yeah. We are we are completely open. We will invest in what we think is the best investment, and we have 28,000 choices. Yeah, and we have a team that basically that's that's what we do. We we research. Yeah. Let me ask a question, probably because I haven't read as many of the newsletters that come out or the emails that come out. Well, you need to start reading Paul's emails. Uh, I, okay. I, I'll just, <laughs> so, <laughs> are you buying the stocks individually and in, in the assembling in the fund, or are you buying 
a mutual fund that has those stocks in it and just moving that mutual fund holding into your holding, into your mutual fund. Yeah, we're buying. Did I, did yeah, make sense yeah, to describe that? Yeah, in our, in our mutual funds, we are buying individual stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're buying the individual stocks, the Coca Cola's, that sort of thing. And then within the portfolio, which, of which our fund is a part of, we buy other funds and ETFs that complement our funds. Okay. There is no symbol as such for virtual funds. Yes, yes, there is. Yeah, ARSKX is the stock fund, ARINX is the <coughs> income fund, and ARCHX is the balance fund. How well has that done relative to s and uh, The stock fund, as of yesterday, I believe, is uh, maybe 0.2 percent off the off the S and P 500. So it's done pretty well. The, our balance fund is beating the index, and uh, the income fund is a little less than the index right now. Um, but the but index is the yeah, the index the is the, the other people in your class. yeah, other people in our class basically. Well, the actually the index is actually higher than the average. So I know that's a whole other topic probably, but. So, yeah. Do you foresee any kind of change with the baby boomers retiring starting to go down again? Uh, on time, on a regular basis? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, uh, the, the question is, you know, is there any, do we see any, foresee any change with the baby boomers taking money out of the market? The answer is no. And, and, and here's why. The, most baby boomers are smart enough that they, that they, as they pull money out, they pull it out over time. Nobody retires at the age of 65 and says, hey, I'm going to spend all my money at the age of 66, right? They say, people live for a long time. I need to make my money last till I'm 85, <laughs> 95 years old, right? And then, and then right behind the baby boomers, we have the echo boom, if anybody's ever heard of that. Okay, the echo boomers are, we have pent-up demand of all these folks that are living with their parents that need to buy homes, and, and, and that sort of thing, and, and that are inheriting money, and they're keeping that money invested over time. So um, for, for years, I, I, I was kind of in this camp, well, yeah, if the baby boomers start taking out all their money, what happens to the stock market? And I tried to do all kinds of research in that regards. But then is what I realized just through common sense, and I was like, well, they're not going to pull all their money out in one day, and, you know, they're going to do it over time. And then, and then every every parent, not every parent, but most parents like to leave some amount of money for their kids, you know, so their kids can go blow it. Yeah. So the, so the idea of printing money from the federal government, or whoever, money is out there. I mean, from, from your perspective, money is out there. Once it's out there, it's got to go into the, into the system to be invested or spent. Oh, yeah. So it's not going away. No. The, the the velocity of money, the amount of money that's out in the in our go to shadowstats.com if anybody likes the internet and look at the amount of money that we've printed over the last so many years. It'll tell you what the what's called M1, M2, M3. Not to get into that, but the money supply is huge, but it's just not finding its way into the economy because of this multiplier effect. Because they forced the, a lot of that money back into the banks coffers. So the $2 billion that Apple has in cash or whatever the, the number is. $142 billion. Is sitting in cash in banks across the world. Yes. Just in cash. A lot of it. Or in, or in treasuries or things like that. Yeah, because they can't expatriate it, bring it home to even right, create. Right, right, right. <coughs> but that's just for example. There's plenty of companies out there with a lot of cash. Yeah. Yeah. So someday it might find its way into the yeah, it, it will. It, it, it'll it'll find its way back. It's just gonna take time. And inflation. And inflation. Yeah. Yeah. It'll it'll spur inflation. Should. Can you explain the position to the Why Microsoft, with as much money as they have had and do have, the stock has done nothing in fifteen years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I follow Microsoft, right? One, I think the CEO is pathetic, okay? I think he does a bad job. But you buy it for the free cash flow yield that the company has because ultimately they could go private. I mean, and then, and then you'd have a good payoff. But
But in the meantime, you're earning a 3.5% dividend, which is greater than the 10-year Treasury note. Okay? Um, you know, Microsoft uh, is not innovating any longer. Um, it's just a cash cow. I mean, and, and ultimately, that will get recognized at some point. Or they have enough money to generate the next big idea. That, that's why you invest in them. All right. Anyways, with that, I appreciate you know you guys coming this morning for breakfast, you know, as opposed to dinner. But uh, anyways, if you have any questions, I'll be around afterwards, or you can get a hold of Kathy or Paul uh, in the office. Um, and uh, again, I thank them for having me, and hopefully this was somewhat informative for you guys. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you.